Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. I guess we are two minutes into my time slot, and it was a lunch break. So people should have had plenty of time to arrive. But they will arrive anyway, hopefully. Um, I'm uh, Gabor Hoichi, and this is uh, building, uh, bringing your ideas to fruition in Drupal Core. And I did this talk before with, uh, with a much scarier title. And more people showed up for that, interestingly. Um, but the reason I'm doing this talk is because I want to share my experience with the value you can get by contributing to Drupal Core and the value you can provide for Drupal Core by providing um, your contributions. Um, I'm working with Drupal for nine years. Um, I started out in 2003 um, because I needed Drupal for a Hungarian website and it was not fully translatable to Hungarian. Um, so I kind of needed to work on that. And uh, nine years ago, Drupal was not much bigger than core. So when you were about to contribute, it was not really a question of contributing to core or something else, because there was core, and if you had a bug, you needed to fix it there. If you've been to Dries' keynote, that was about, still about the time when Dries, when Dries changed something in Drupal core. He went into all of contrib and fixed all of contrib at the same time. Uh, that's not really possible anymore. Um, I'm also, um, so that's my experience as a core developer. I'm also the maintainer for Drupal 6, the release maintainer for Drupal 6. Um, that's a little bit more than five years there. So um, I was appointed at the start of 2007 and, uh, and we released Drupal 6 and I'm maintaining and putting out releases for Drupal 6. So that's the side of my experience where I'm dealing with stuff from others and need to critique their contributions and need to push back sometimes. Um, so that's that kind of experience. I'm also uh, working for Acquia. Actually, today is my five-year anniversary at Acquia, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, so I have that experience where I have the business pushing behind me is like this big client needs this done in Drupal Core, and then I need to interface the business to the Drupal community and kind of figure out what, what if the big client pays big money, but the Drupal community doesn't really want that to happen that way and we need to like resolve these issues. Um, and um, uh, looks like I have a lot of free time on my hands because I'm also leading the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative, which is in a small part sponsored by Acquia and a, a large part uh, in my free time, which is about making um, Drupal 8 support multilingual services better. I have a session about that tomorrow on the core conversations track. Uh, it should be pretty interesting for those of you who work with multilingual sites. We have a lot of improvements and even more coming. <clears throat> so I have an experience in there to lead a volunteer team in the Drupal community and try to get heard and try to make stuff happen that doesn't really have like a big corporate agenda. We need to figure it out ourselves, and we need to have partners in crime from different companies and, and that, um, that area. So I have a lot of, a lot of uh, I, I've seen a lot of approaches to different problems. And what I did is I created this uh, flowchart of, of my thinking of, of how, how it's best to approach working with Drupal Core, and we're going to walk through this flowchart in this session. And you are able to download this flowchart from my site uh, for later reference. It has basically the summary of what I'm going to say, but I'm, I hopefully will be even more colorful. So how it starts out is that you have an idea for Drupal Core or you have a problem with Drupal Core. Uh, so you either have a bright idea that you wanted to implement and, and, uh, and you wanted to solve it right now, or you have a problem and you want it solved. Now, the first thing that you should consider there is what version of Drupal you're working with. You're likely not working with Drupal 8. Anybody's working with Drupal 8? No? Okay. You're likely working with either 7 or 6. Okay. The release dates for these are uh, 2008 for Drupal 6, 2011 for Drupal 7, and maybe 2013 sometime for Drupal 8. Um, that's the current plan. Um, we don't know exactly. And, uh, and this means that, that we basically have, so Drupal 6 is already, Drupal 6 can already be considered old. It's uh, four years old in, in internet terms, that's like decades. 
And Drupal 7 is, is, um, is still very actively worked on. And then Drupal 8 is, is, uh, is hugely in flux. There's a lot of changes going on and all kinds of stuff. So if you have like sparky new ideas, like make something new shiny or put a filter there or make the node admin page searchable or, or make the tables uh, mobile responsive or I don't know, whatever, or make media handling better in Drupal core, then all of that shiny stuff happens in Drupal 8 or in Contrib. It's not possible to add big shiny new features to Drupal 7 or Drupal 6. It's just not possible. We maintain backwards compatibility there. So what we do for Drupal 7 is we might introduce small uh, improvements that are uh, enhancing the release but are not, uh, not breaking backwards compatibility. One example is the latest release of Drupal 7, 7.15, included Sementity field API improvements. So modules can use set, get, and uh, handle entity language much easier than before with 7.15. Um, so modules can declare 7.15 as a requirement for their releases and then use those new features in Drupal 7.15. And there's also maintenance fixes in Drupal 7. And Drupal 6 is all about maintenance. We don't add any new features. If there are some uh, performance problems or some security issues, then we go there and fix them. So some examples of these are for Drupal 6, uh, we fixed the big performance um, problem with the uh, taxonomy uh, term listings. Uh, we changed some, uh, some index uh, queries. We also fix security fixes regularly. And there are also modules and features that were removed later, like blog API, that are only present in Drupal 6. So it only makes sense for them to be fixed in Drupal 6 because they are not applicable to future versions. And then there is uh, Drupal 7, where we are a little bit less strict about changes because it's not as old and we are like still actively uh, figuring it out uh, in Contrib. So we, we figured out some problems with the field UI that we solved in Drupal Core. We've added these new entity API um, functions that improve how you can use languages. And we, of course, also do security fixes there. And then examples for Drupal 8 as are endless. So whatever can happen in Drupal 8. We are adding a brand new configuration API. If you've been to the keynote, you've seen that that exports configuration to YAML files and then you can git version control it or whatever version control system you want to use. And you can push it to the site and import and export. And we are working with uh, Symfony to add a lot, of, a lot of parts of their framework into Drupal 8. So there's huge changes going on in Drupal 8. Um, so depending on whether you want to have these uh, huge big impact changes or you want to have simple improvements or fix issues, um, there's different levels of things that you can do based on what release you're using. If you want to include um, a visual taxonomy selector, that's not at all possible in Drupal 6 because it's a fixed feature set and we want to keep it that way. Um, so one awkward example, let's say, you want to fix the language code form field. That's a real life example that happened. There somebody submitted a Drupal 6 bug that the language code form field is, uh, is, is uh, as wide as the screen. And it only takes 10 characters and it's not possible to type anymore. And it's very misleading. Uh, and they suggested that we shrink it down to a, to a smaller size so that it's visible that it only takes a small uh, language code there. And they submitted this for Drupal 6. Now our process, unfortunately for the submitter, is that we want to ensure that these bugs uh, keep being fixed in Drupal core. So if we fix something, we want to ensure it's never appearing again. And we do two things for that. And one of the things is that we ask you to, okay, please do this fix for Drupal 8, although you have never used Drupal 8 possibly. Uh, but we want to ensure that it's fixed uh, all across. So we ask you to do it for Drupal 8 and then uh, we ask people or you to help backport that fix to Drupal 7 and then ask people or you to help backport that to Drupal 6. So although your problem is with Drupal 6 or 7, what we ask you to do is to work out that for Drupal 8, which is uh, painful at times. Um, but if your issue is not applicable to 8 or 7, it can get easier. And the other thing that we are trying to do to, to help this problem is we are adding automated tests. So whenever we find bugs, uh, we usually add automated tests when we fix the bug so that the bug never appears again. 
So then, if the bug appears sometime later, then we can then the test will indicate that there uh, that there is the bug reappearing in that place. So depending on where you want to contribute, there is a there is a scale of changes that you can do, and there is also a possibility that you are asked to move forward to a version that you are not even using, and um, either you need to accommodate for that, or um, or you'll need to wait through this process to get the fix into Drupal 6. So, it's, so then it becomes a decision of, of how soon you need that fix and which way you go. And I think there's basically two ways to go here. You either want to make sure to implement it right, and then it applies to all versions of Drupal possibly. You need to fix it 8 and then 7 and 6. Or you want to have it implemented right now and you don't care about this thing. And that's the first that we want to talk about. Is when you have like a business need and you want it fixed right now and you don't care if it's fixed three, it takes three months to get it fixed in Drupal 8 and then 7 and 6. You have a business need and you need to have it done. That's, that's a very common need. So the reasons for this is because if you submit, it, submit a patch to core, it takes time. Um, you never know how long it takes um, unless you put, it, put in the resources yourself to manage it through this process. Um, then you have a client who needs the fix right now because the site goes down or it's, the, um, it's a show at night, it's a big media event and, and the site needs to be up, etc. You might disagree with the community, you might want to go your own way. Um, there's multiple modules in Contrib for having admin navigation, for example, because people have different preferences for that. Or, as I've explained, the extent of change might not be allowed in the branch that you want to work on in Drupal 6, 7, etc. And then there are two ways to, if you want to implement it right now, then there are two ways, basically. One is to have uh, custom patches on your own. So basically change Drupal core in a way um, that fits your need and, and have patches for that. For those of you who don't know what, what a patch is, it's basically a file that tells you what was the old code and what is the new code that you changed the old code to. And it's just the file listing the code that you've actually touched. So it's a depending on the size of the change, it's a relatively small text file that, that tells you what did you change there. So you can maintain these custom changes for yourself, or you can use Drupal's APIs to write custom code on top of Drupal that does not touch Drupal itself and, uh, and use that to uh, achieve your goals. Uh, I've di I did both in, on different projects. So for example, I've been working a lot on the Drupal Gardens project and we've had and we have some bugs in the Drupal Gardens project that we want to fix in Drupal core, but the process for fixing them took a long time, and we need to fix it for our clients. Basically, we have the same stuff, so we maintain a list of patches in Drupal Gardens. Um, it used to be a patches.txt file, and we now use uh, DrushMake for that to maintain the patch list. There are different tools you can use. You can use a simple text file to list all those changes. You can, if you really want to be fancy pants, then you can go the branching uh, path. You can branch from the core Git repository and then maintain Git branches of your changes. And then you figure out all the changes that you make. Or you can use Drush Make. The, the Gardens team uses this. And uh, the Spark team that I'm currently working on also uses Drush Make. And it does apply one or two patches um, to fix issues that we needed fixes right now. Um, the preferred or the suggested way in this case is to submit your patches to the community anyway, even if you like really need to fix something right away and it's a very custom solution and you are certainly sure it's not the best way to fix the problem. Even then, if you submit that patch to the community on Drupal.org, open an issue and attach the patch to the issue, then anybody can come around, pick your issue up and provide a better way to fix it. Okay, so you need to fix it right away. You fix it right away. But if you submit your patch to the community, you don't need to take care of your patch if you don't want to take care of your patch. Even if you don't take care of your patch, somebody might find that patch later and help you out and provide a better, better fix and, and get it to core. So if you just start out this process, then somebody might pick it up. Of course, it's the best if you maintain it through the review process and get it in core, but you might not have time for that. And 
Then the other method of maintaining these changes is Drupal's hooks. So if you are, if you, um, how many of you are uh, developers or consider yourself developers in core? Okay, some of you are not, that's good. So Drupal hooks, I'm not, I'm not gonna have code exam. This is like the extent of the code I have on my slides, so that should be fine. So Drupal's hooks basically allow you to, to uh, hook into processes that Drupal run. So Drupal has a hook menu alter, for example, that allows you to change how Drupal handles requests coming in from the browser. So it allows you to totally change how certain pages will be handled by Drupal. You can replace the built-in handlers with your own stuff. Um, so, you, so you can replace basically whatever Drupal would do on any path or almost any path with hook menu alter. Um, if, if that's a high level change, so like you can change how, how all user profiles displayed by altering the user profile URLs. If you want um, finer grained changes, then there's hook module implements alter, which is a crazy powerful hook, which allows you to turn off or replace almost any functionality in Drupal core, anything by writing code or change the order of how the code runs. It's crazy. Um, there's a lot of possibilities in there and a, lot, and a lot of possibilities to screw up as well. But that's, that's an almighty, that's the almighty powerful hook that basically allows you to do anything. So like if you, if you want a module to never run on cron and, you, and it doesn't have a setting for it, then you can run, then you can write a three line or four line module to remove the cron hook from that module uh, programmatically and you don't need to touch the module source code. And the module would remove it when the, when the hooks are collected, basically. So that's very powerful. And there's uh, two more hooks that I can suggest to you. There's hook form alter, which you can use to change all, all the form processing that happens in Drupal core, either the structure of the forms or how they are validated or how they are submitted. So you can change the, the actual form layout. You can change, you can add JavaScript and CSS to the forms you can change how any field is validated on the form. You can change how the form submission happens, where the submission goes. You can change all that interaction with this hook. And finally, there's hook page alter for all the pages that are not forms. Um, uh, not all the pages. So the pages that follow best practices in Drupal and build their pages with uh, render structures. You can use this hook to change page content, remove pieces of content from the page, add new pieces of content to the page, et cetera. So there's these four hooks, menu altering, um, hook implements altering, uh, form altering, and page altering, that allows you to alter almost any, to change almost anything in Drupal core without touching the code itself that does it, okay? So you don't need to go there and touch it. The good thing about this one is that the internal APIs, or the thing that you need to look at here, is that the internal APIs might change over time. So whatever you change in the hooks, or whatever you change in the forms, if Drupal core changes the form slightly, or the hook takes, uh, or the hook is updated to, uh, to, I don't know, take care of a security problem, then your override of the hook will not take care of the security problem, so your override will be um, still insecure. And of course, the bigger the change you make, the more divergent you go from core. But there's full modules to use these hooks, like hook uh, menu alter. Uh, there is the CTools page manager module, if you heard about that. that. That is the nickname for it is the user interface for a hook, page, a hook uh, menu alter. Because you can go in and put in menu paths and change menu paths and then put whatever page callbacks for them, et cetera. Uh, on a very visual way, like assign a panel to it instead of the original uh, page handling, et cetera. So that's, that's very powerful, and there's UIs built on top of this. And still, again, if you do these as uh, alters, then you're writing your own custom module for the site. And contributing these things as content modules is very useful. There's all kinds of modules doing form altering, page altering, and, and menu altering, as I've said. So it, it's very useful to put this out to the community again because you get feedback and you might go to sleep and then by, by the morning or by next week or something, somebody comes back and says, that, oh, that's a very useful module, I wanna do that too and I'm gonna help you out. And in this case, it's likely a bigger feature change. 
So it would also be useful to propose the changes uh, to Drupalate for this case. So if you want, want stuff implemented right away, um, there's basically two paths, I believe. So either you patch uh, your modules, you directly go into the code and change the code, or you use Drupal's mechanisms to avoid changing the code and write your own code to overwrite Drupal's code. Um, maintaining patches can be painful, and then you, it's a, it's a hard word to say you are forking Drupal core, but you are. So when you update Drupal core, you might have problems applying your patches again, et cetera. And for using overwrite hooks, you need to watch out for changes as much as for patches. So it's important to keep track of when you're updating Drupal core, what's happening there. But these are very good ways to get business requirements solved right away without waiting for the community and then still have the opportunity to, to, uh, to push it back from, to push it from, push it to the community and then get some feedback. But it's also possible to screw up, totally, um, to do whatever you need until the next morning because the client needs the site launched. Um, so, so in an ideal way, um, you wanna implement it right and you wanna get it to the community and manage it through this process. And now, now I'm, I'm uh, gonna hopefully help you out in this area. So the good thing about putting this out to the community in the form of patches, in the form of modules, and then trying to maintain it through the process of eight, seven, and six if you need to, if it's a bug fix. If it's a feature, then you would only put it, in, put it on Drupal 8. It's because you get uh, very valuable feedback from the community. There's a lot of back and forth on the issue queues, but most of the time it's very valuable feedback. They tell you if you're using an API wrong. They tell you if, if you could write this more effectively. They do performance testing. Uh, they get you all kinds of feedback, not always. We'll get to that part as well if there's nothing's going on. But uh, if all goes well, then you get a lot of great feedback and you can learn a lot from that and improve your own solutions as well. So that, that's, that's a lot of help. Then they help to use best practices, whether it's they suggest you have like a security bug in there or you are not using the, um, uh, using the, code, uh, the Drupal code style proper and then people will not be able to understand what the hell is going on in that code. That's also very positive because when you hire two more people to the company to help work with you, then they will instantly understand the code if it follows the, the Drupal way of, of uh, coding and APIs. Uh, it also helps you fix it across Drupal versions because even though like your business requirement right now is to fix it on Drupal 7, you're gonna upgrade to Drupal 8 sometime. And if it's not fixed on Drupal 8, then you'll need to spend the time again on Drupal 8 to figure out what changed and how to fix the same thing there, which is not good. So you want to, um, want to have it fixed on Drupal 8 uh, so you don't need to face the same problem again. You can get it off your plate, as I've said. And the best part, the, the part that I love the most about this, is then you make others build off of your stuff. So I can tell you about two um, sneaky things that I did in the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative, okay? It may, it may be not the nicest thing, but it's very good process-wise. So one thing is that we wanted to introduce language support on blocks, okay? And we knew that the blocks initiative is going to happen and they're gonna rewrite blocks all together and they're gonna be plugin-based and they're gonna be all different. But we've seen that it's gonna happen later in the game and we needed language on blocks. And if we wait for them to do all that conversion, they might be ready, they are not yet in core, the, the blocks conversion, I think. They have a sandbox. So if they are not ready on time, then we need to start the work after they are ready. So what we decided is we built the language functionality for blocks this March and we got it committed this March to the existing blocks system in Drupal core, okay? So now Drupal 8 supports language on blocks, but it's not yet converted to the plugin system that the blocks initiative is working on. But we put in our stuff and now the blocks initiative needs to work with what we have and they, need, and they will take over the language implementation because it's there, right? So, so we, we got it off, off our plate and then they will figure out how to make it pluginable and we don't need to figure it out anymore, okay? So it's not our job. Our job would have been, maybe would have been harder and our deadlines would have been much more tighter 
if we do it later in the cycle because then all this stuff is all different from Drupal 7. It's harder to find people who know the new system and build all that stuff. But they know how they do pluginification and we knew how we want to do language. So combining this, this uh, order, it was a very good fit for us. And the same happened, a very funny thing, uh, this last two weeks that we posted, um, we want to make properties on entities multilingual, like the title and the author and the publication status, stuff like that multilingual, that's not multilingual yet. And we converted some entities to that system, the test entity to that system last week, it got committed. And the property uh, work that's happening right now needed to work off of our approach to making it multilingual. So they have multilingual property support in because we were the first to get it, um, get it converted. Okay, so, so working with the community, uh, there's a, you need to look for what's going on and then, and then you'll be able to, to help at the right time and then get your, get your stuff moving with all the rest of the processes, which is great. And that's very enjoyable as well. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Catherine Senzi, one of my colleagues. So she said she enjoys working toward a common cause with smart, friendly people. And that uh, echoes a lot of, of what I said is that you get a lot of smart feedback and you're working together on, on this process to, to get everything um, ready at the same time. And then there is a comment from uh, CHX who said he definitely finds it intrinsically rewarding. In other words, yes, this is done right, gives me great joy. Is, uh, is a testament to the feedback loop that is an issue to you that, that, that helps reassure you that what you are doing is good and others think it's good. And, and then, then everybody can build off of that uh, knowing that it's the right solution for the problem. And it's not just what you made up um, quickly for, for some reason. And there's really, again, two ways to this. You either have a huge thing that you wanted to solve, like Drupal 8 Multilingual Initiative, and then that's, you really need to start a discussion and have meetings and have a G, uh, groups, the Drupal.org group, et cetera, or you want something fixed, something controllable, small, and then you start an issue on Drupal.org. And uh, the, the important thing with both is that you need to manage them through a review process. Um, you need to talk to people about your problems and figure out the targets that you want to reach and how to get there or you need to manage through all the feedback that you get that it's not performant, it's not secure, or it's breaking these APIs, or it's not in line with what that initiative wants to do, etc. It's only going to happen if you manage it through a review process. So as I've said before, you can drop stuff on the community and it might mature into something. But if you just drop it off, then there's no insurance whatsoever that anything's going to happen to it. Um, if you actually take it into your hands and, and manage it through a review process, then you can ensure that there's actually something happening. And the most common problem there that people uh, face is that you drop it down and then, then there's silence. And nobody's coming over to your issue. It's like there's nobody in there. And the sad reality is that can easily happen. So if you look on Drupal.org, this is stats I pulled yesterday. Um, there are 10,000, over 10,000 core issues open. And the overall average for like features to be solved is, one in, is over one and a half years. Okay. It's good, it's relatively good in the last month because the things that we are working on are like actively submitted and then solved and then submitted and solved. But if you don't actively work on something, you keep it lingering, then it will basically go into this bin of forgotten stuff. Or it has a very good chance of going into this bin of forgotten stuff. So this stats and the numbers are all in Drupal.org. Um, and, it, and it shows uh, very much that, that if you don't take care of what you put in, then, then the most likely happening is that it's forgotten. But the good news is there's a lot of tips I can give you to avoid this situation. So there is issue submission guidelines that help you submit issues in a way that takes people's attention. There's issue tags that you can apply to issues that help people find your issues. Like if you tag your, if you do have a usability fix that improves Drupal's usability, you tag your issues with the usability tag. 
and there's a very good chance that, that one of our usability team people will jump on the issue uh, in a day or two. Reason for that is there is not a lot of issues submitted with the usability tag and our usability people are very actively looking at the issues submitted under the usability tag. And there's all kinds of other tags that you can use to, to get attention on your issue. Obviously, use the, the proper tags if you're not using, like if you have a database fix and you submit it as a usability issue, that's not gonna help. So, so use the right tools. This, these two pages explain the right process. I have these slides published. Actually, I have it already on the, on the site note, but I will have them later as well. Then if you have bigger overall work that you want to make happen, uh, there's these Drupal initiatives on groups.drupal.org, which are umbrellas for, uh, for, uh, for big work, like configuration management, web services, multilingual, HTML5, et cetera. So these initiatives help direct work and try to focus people on things that matter most, and, try to, and, and, and the leaders there, if you're interested in these topics, will love if you go and you want to like help with HTML5 or multilingual. Um, then they will love if you come because the, everybody needs more hands. So if you have concerns about how the web services is, is happening, then you can go to Larry Garfield and talk to him. And, and he will certainly um, listen to you and see what you, um, what you have to say and what you want to achieve there. There's also a summary page, drupal.org slash community initiative slash Drupal core. It's not the most up-to-date screenshot of that. This page actually posts regular updates of the initiatives. So every two weeks we have a telephone call with all the initiative leads. And then there's a summary posted here of all the updates that we've did in, in the two weeks and, um, and um, all the people that helped in those two weeks are, are all uh, mentioned here. So this is a good place to figure out what's going on right now with the big uh, happenings. And there is also all kinds of other sub pages here where you can find people and topics that you might be interested in. Like this is a JavaScript link there that links to JavaScript issues in Drupal core. If you are concerned about JavaScript performance, then you might go there and figure out uh, what's the active issues and where you can help or, or who or if you click on those issues, then you can find people who work on JavaScript and then talk to those people about your issues. So you don't necessarily want to work on the issues that are there. You might have your own stuff, but you can figure out the people who you want to talk to. There's also Drupal groups for topics, different topics. So there is the Entity API group, for example, right here. You can go there and see people interested in the Entity API if you want to improve that one. There is a MongoDB group, there's a DevOps group, et cetera. So so you can find like-minded people here as well and then uh, find what they work on. There's a less known tip. Uh, I've been trying to advocate automating this, uh, this uh, process, but I think it's, it's pretty valuable. If you have a problem in Drupal core and you can identify the files that are related to your problem, then you can look at the history of the file and see all the fixes that were made recently to the file. And there is the names of the people who worked on this stuff. So there's Core, there's Richard Erickson, there's Haas, there's Dave Reed, et cetera. So you can see who's been working on these files recently, who is also interested in fixing problems in this area, who had problems in this area recently. They likely have clients who, who use this functionality heavily or something. This is robots.txt. It's not, it's, it was an easy example because it's, it's a short, uh, short URL and you can easily type it in. But you can basically navigate to all this information on drupalcode.org. You go there, there's a link to the Drupal project. And then you check out the, the different files in the Drupal project and you can see who worked on different things in Drupal core. So it's a very direct information of who worked on it recently. There's also a maintainer's text file in Drupal core, but that's not very well updated. It might have good information for you in different areas, but it's not very well updated. And then, there's always real-time uh, meeting opportunities, uh, even, even if virtual real-time meeting opportunities. So there's drupal.org slash IRC that explains you IR, the IRC chat system, which we use very heavily to, uh, to discuss stuff with each other. And there's drupal.org slash core office hours, where um, I think, it, yeah, 
core office hours where you can go and see who to talk to for, for different core issues. There's mentors um, having office hours um, every week, different times. You can go there and see and, and get simple issues to work on or get help from them work on issues uh, for your own stuff. There's a trading system. You can like find others to work on your thing and, and you can work on others' problems. And it's also very useful to look at drupal.org slash planet, which is an aggregation of a lot of the blogs from the Drupal community. And you can have an idea of what's going on here. You can get updates from initiatives. You can get posts from people submitting uh, new modules. Um, and if you have big ideas that you want to make happen, you can post to your blog and then ask uh, to be included on Drupal Planet. It's not a hard, it's much easier to get included on Drupal Planet than to get a uh, Git account on Drupal.org, I think. So, so, um, so, so you, can, you can get on there. It's, it's read, read by a lot of people. So there's a lot of techniques that you can use to find people to come, come to your stuff and look at it. Uh, the key is to try and, try and find like-minded people, and the key is to try and find people who have time. So one of the reasons I didn't suggest maintainers.txt is because those guys are usually very busy. So if you look at like others who worked on patches, or if you look at people in the groups, um, then those are likely have some more time because they are not already committed to all kinds of other contributions. But if then you find a lot of people, then you might go to the other side of the horse. At least Hungarians have this thing of jump to the other side of the horse, where you have too many voices and it's kind of getting impossible to maintain. Uh, that's a sort of a good problem to have, but it can also be a very stressful problem. Um, so, so then my suggestion is in that case, you should look at everybody's opinion and try to crystallize uh, summaries of what's going on. Don't let the discussion wander into all kinds of um, unrelated areas. So let everybody be heard, but do not cater to everybody's opinions. So try to filter it down to what's, what's uh, relevant for the, for the issue. Keep your issue summary updated with all the latest thinking. Uh, the issue summary is the top of the issue, is on the top of the issue, and anybody can edit the issue summary, go in and fix it. It's a wiki page style solution for having updated uh, summaries of what's going on. And be there on the issue. I know it, it takes time, unfortunately, that's, uh, it's a commitment that you need to make. But if you are on the issue, then you'll get to that last month stat where it takes five days to, to fix something and not into the old stats where it takes a year and a half. And if you have an overall plan with follow-ups for things that are not, not in the focus of your issue, um, so if you have a clear, a defined a scope of what you want to solve, and the rest that's not in your scope, you can submit other issues and then work on them later if people are interested. Then you can keep your, um, keep your head very, uh, very straight and on the goals. And there's a Drupal code of conduct, conduct that you can look at. Um, there's a very short summary of, of um, the way that you hopefully will behave on the Drupal.org issue queues and generally in the Drupal community. Um, that that if, even if you're in a stressful situation, you just go there and like read the five points. It's very short. And then you're going to sit back and drink a coffee, and then everything's good. Um, and then there are process ways to deal with this big, uh, big um, too many people problem. And there are different processes that people use to handle these, um, these issues. So one of it is uh, structured tagging that a lot of us use in the Drupal community is, um, is up there um, at the top of Drupalicon is that you use specific tags to tag up your issues, like my initiative Drupal 8 Multilingual uses D8MI, which is Drupal 8 Multilingual Initiative. And all the issues that we are working on are tagged with D8MI. And then we solve those issues, we get them committed to Drupal Core, so it's all happening in the core issue queue. It's easy to find all the issues related to D8MI, but there's a lot of issues. So you get pages and pages and pages and pages of issues. I think it's like seven or eight pages of issues on Drupal.org. And a lot of things are not even yet described in issues. And then there is another approach uh, with meta issues where people open one issue 
And then as a summary issue where you can subscribe and people post updates to what's going on. And the real work is happening in these sub-issues. And that can also be combined with tagging, obviously. And then all the issues are committed one by one as well. And the, and the good thing here is that you basically have one point of, of contact for the work. So you can subscribe to this issue. There's a button on, on every issue to subscribe to all the follow-ups. And you can see what's going on there. And you don't need to manually hunt down all the sub-issues that are happening because you get updates of what are those. So that's a good way to organize work as well. And the third way to organize work that's being used by the Whiskey, the Web Services Initiative, and the Blocks and Layouts Initiative, for example, pretty heavily, is that they make a copy of Drupal Core in a project sandbox. They make a copy of Drupal Core, and they have issues on the sandbox issue queue. It has its own issue queue and fix all the stuff that they want to fix or improve, and commit all that stuff that they want to commit and improve. And then all those things, um, when they are at a point when a set of functionality makes sense to merge into Drupal Core, is being reviewed. And after the review, it's being merged into Drupal Core. So that's a kind of a different way to work, because you're working on a copy of Drupal Core in a different issue queue, and then your work is merged into Drupal Core instead of being committed one by one. Different problems have different approaches. So if you want to work on blocks and layouts or web services, then you'll encounter that, that approach a lot. And then if you are basically feel like you are done, then you can, of course, sit back and rest. Uh, unless that is not the case. Uh, if Party Popper Cat uh, shows up. Uh, in that case, um, your, what you are experiencing is that what our RTBC, which means ready to be committed or reviewed and tested by the community, depending on how uh, long you are in the community. Um, so it's ready, it's, uh, it's um, reviewed and tested by the community. It doesn't mean that if someone believes that it's ready to go into core, then everybody agrees with that. So people can come in and say, okay, there is still a security issue there or a performance problem or I don't agree with how you did this. Um, so you need to be, um, you need to be conscious of that possibly happening. And you need to be also conscious of this not happening automatically. If you, are, if you are marking an issue ready to be included in core, it's not included right away. Uh, I'm tweeting Angie, uh, for example, I tweeted her an hour ago to, to commit a patch that I really want to be included for tomorrow's demo that I'm doing for the Drupal 8 initiative, the multilingual initiative. So, it, so it, it might need some, uh, some marketing to get your patch in. But then you are basically done and then you can go party. Um, so if you want to get involved with this process, you can get started this week. There's a, uh, a contribution sprint on Friday where people will uh, be able to help you get started on this uh, process. And I'm not, I think it's happening in the, in the uh, uh, Wunderkrat Coder uh, contribution launch on Friday. So if you are here on Friday, we would love to see you there and get started contributing to Drupal Core. Do you have any questions? Any concerns? Yes. So you mentioned you like that uh, Drupal code head patch list. I've never seen that before myself. Um, I have the same kind of issue where a lot of the sites I work on are Drupal 6 or Drupal 7, definitely not any Drupal 8 sites I work mm -hmm. on. Drupal 6. Definitely. Yeah. Made some of the so, can you do you think there's like an easier way of keeping track of what patches are most, which are kind of like accepted, kind of ready, ready to be rolled out, and keep track of those, and then have a listing of patches per issue based on different versions of Drupal? Like, is there a way to ease that process of, of finding fixes now that aren't necessarily going to go to court, or will take time to go? Yeah, so the question was that if you have a lot of patches that you need to maintain their importance and figure out which ones are crucial to your project and then figure out which ones are accepted or likely to be accepted and how to, how to maintain all this information about your changes. For me, so, sorry, if I interject. That's fine. It's more for like, I, I have my own system of doing it, but it's helpful if I can share that information. Share that information with other people who are trying to find particular patches. 
the importance of your yeah yes uh, there is no good way of like sharing patch sets if you mean you were interested in that one there's a module called hack I think which will kind of like give you a, a synopsis of which modules you have that have been patched or diverged from both yeah it's more about sharing that with other people so I like if, if I spend a lot of time trying to find and fix find the right patch that isn't in Ford yet sharing that information and sharing it could save someone else a lot of time right and yeah yeah, so this is an example from Drupal Gardens. I, I hope this is not secret information. I think if you export your site, if you export your site from Drupal Gardens, you get this file. It's a make file that we use for Drupal Gardens. So what we do is we have the we have meta information about about the patches here and comments. So these are like plain comments, and we say who updated the patch when and what did they do. So if they rerolled it or if they updated it because of changes or or if, they, if we, they figure that we actually use a different patch. So it has tracking of who did what with the patch when. And this is, the, we don't have a good, good solution for like tracking this in an outside system, but we have extensive comments and we do use some patches, as you can yeah, see. I was, I was gonna ask if you guys, because you talked about how like, you have a lot of patches. Quite a few, guys. quite a few patches here. Yeah. Yeah. So, that file? Oh, okay, thank you. So this is, this is a Drush make file. So this, this can build Drupal Gardens with a command. So this is like downloads Drupal core and then applies all these patches in order and then Drupal Gardens is built. Um, so this is automated. This is, the patch file itself is machine understandable. And then we have patches for stuff listed here. So we have like, I don't know, different like improved text trim and then we have a patch for some iframe whatever issue and et cetera. So we have patches for core and contrib as well. And we have uh, quite a few modules in gardens, really. It's a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a lot, of, lot of work and a lot of value that was put into this to fix all these things and, and That's a value have it in. Sure. Yes, it is. I think if you, like, you can try download Drupal Gardens and uh, I guess export the site on Drupal Gardens and then see, the, I think this file is included. I'm not entirely sure, but I think. So that's what we do. And the Spark project is very similarly organized. I'm not sure that we have uh, extensive comments there, but, but we've kind of, this is not that directory. Yeah, we don't have extensive comments, but, but we have a Drush make file just as much, and we have some comments on what we do. A Spark is not an old project, so we are, have, have just like short comments here and then patches. And this is on Drupal.org, so Spark is hosted fully on Drupal.org. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, just a, a comment on your opinion. The, the, the file you just showed uh, from a Drupal Garden showed a, a huge amount of patches uh, for Drupal Core. Yes. Uh, is that satisfactory? That if, I mean, if you use them in a production system, uh, in, in your opinion, are these uh, patches ready to be committed, or, or are they just uh, kind of the, the best uh, thing you could do uh, at the moment uh, for your sites? I think most of them are, are very good patches, um, but, no, but not all of them have agreement from the community of inclusion. Um, and in our case, so, that, so maybe I shouldn't have showed the gardens make file because it might, it might encourage you to actually use this many patches. The Drupal Gardens team has, has high, very high profile people on it, like Catherine Sanzi, Peter Volan, and um, Ellen Evans. A lot, a lot, a lot of high-profile names from the Drupal community. Um, so, so they they know very well what they do. So, if you have a team like that, then 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 you can change whatever <laughs> you want, um, because you'll be able to maintain it and figure it out, and you know it anyway. Um, at, so, in in the normal um, situation, unless you have people who really know what they do, I don't suggest using this many patches. Um, it's not a good idea. But if you like really have a business need to do it, then you don't have a choice at all. It's like you need to do it. But 
perhaps I'm thinking more nicely. I, I, isn't it a pity that these aren't committed yeah. to co uh, to coal? It is a pity. Yes, it is a pity. We have regular. Uh, the gardens team has regular. Um, time scheduled to go in and, and follow up on these issues and not just when, when there's a core update, we re-roll them. You've seen like patches re-rolled multiple times when there was a core update, but we also go there and try to convince people again and try to explain why this is useful and try to explain we're using it in production for a year now, and, but it not always works. And we don't want to force anything on people if they, we are, although Acquia is sometimes considered the evil Companies force forces stuff on Drupal. We are not forcing. We are, we are doing patches. We are doing issues. We are arguing with the community. And when we can't get our stuff that way, then we'll have our stuff this way. And that's the same thing that you can do. You don't have, you you don't have time for that. Then you'll need to need to do this. But all the if so, all the patches that we have there are committed are are on Drupal Drupal.org. So. Like I posted this uh, panels patch a couple of weeks ago, posted on Drupal.org, submitted an issue, got feedback from Earl, and, uh, and it's not yet fixed because they want to have a more extended fix that's better for panels. But this fixed our problem right away, so we could like release and demo uh, Spark in an alpha state at least. Because our layouts are not being saved without this patch, so we can't do layouts at all if this patch is not there. So it was like very core to our, our needs. But Earl wants to fix this in a better way, and, this has, and it's a very good path to fix this in a better way. So we're going to work this through the issue process, and we'll get it fixed in a better way, and then we can remove it from the patch we can remove from Spark, and then it will be better for everybody. Anything else? OK. So I hope we'll see you on Friday's contribution sprint then and have fun at the rest of the conference. No, it used to be lighter. Maybe. Maybe. I got you real water. Real water? There's like non sparkling, I mean. So, uh, sparkling water is okay. Well, for presenting? I don't know. I found I have problems if I present it. I they have like nice glasses here, but no water. <laughs> Yes, just that. So you need to like, yeah, you're prepared. I was not that prepared. I'm, I'm not, my lesson. I'm not, I'm not as well. I Yes. I was going to look for you later. So, so when you so yeah. we'll just use Drush Make, so there's no, 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 no. you know Drush? So there's a there's a comment in there called Rush Make that takes a file that explains which core version it should use, which model it should use, which versions of those models. It can check out modules from Git. It can apply patches to modules. Yeah, I'm just checking. Although annoyingly, it doesn't stand out as much. Because this doesn't at all. It is. It's a. When people give it this year, it's supposed to be United Nations. Um, Where's the power? Power is right there. Is there this other side to the CMS that's like I didn't even think when I put it, you know, when I put it off. Oh, well, Drupal's kind of that code as well. So you can document stuff in here? So it's like you're saying this is your 7.x core that you need? 
don't need that page file. No, no, just that. Document that. I didn't arrive last night. And you can share no, the uh, make file. So yeah, what we so have is this make file is on the Spark project. So people can see what we are watching. Like we patched two JavaScript bugs. It's not a lot of stuff. This is Spark. So two JavaScript bugs, and then we patched panels once, and then we did 